So there's an article that Time Magazine has just published entitled The White Supremacist Origins of Exercise in the USA, which has been getting quite a lot of exposure in the headlines. And when this article came out, it was full of so much ridiculous misinformation that I immediately posted a 10 minute rant on social media about all the nonsense that it contained. But I wanted to follow that up today with a more scholarly lecture on YouTube really examining the history of this issue and debunking the false claims. Now, strangely, the Time article actually presents no hard evidence regarding these white supremacist origins. In fact, it barely mentions racism at all. What the article does is mostly talk about sexism in exercise in American history. And I'm going to read to you what I feel are some of the most ridiculous statements in it. Quote, it's really not until the 1980s that you start to have a consensus that everybody should be doing some form of exercise. That's partly the result of the women's movement of the 1960s and 1970s, which pushed back on notions that girls and women aren't capable of doing vigorous exercise because they're fragile. Uh, another quote that she says, well into the 1960s, women were not encouraged to do any kind of strenuous exercise, but they were of course encouraged to do whatever it took to be beautiful and slim. Then again, the idea that all bodies can exert themselves and work hard, including women's bodies, is a really positive development. Uh, so she's saying that that's not until the 1960s that you have this positive development that women as well as men can exert themselves and work hard. So there's a lot more stuff like that in the article. That was just a sampling. There's this idea that American women didn't really exercise prior to the 1960s, or if they did, that was extremely limited, or it was in this very sort of passive and weak way. And there's this general idea or tone that the origins of exercise in the USA, in the West, are fundamentally racist and misogynistic. Now, this Time article is basically promoting a forthcoming book by the author, Natalia Petrozella, who is an associate professor and historian, uh, which greatly surprised me because it doesn't take much cursory research for the common person to see that women were actually heavily involved in athletics prior to the late 20th century. I mean, if you just go on eBay and search for antique photos, you will find tons of images of women from the early 1900s and the 1800s as well, exercising in gyms and outdoors. I mean, this stuff is everywhere. It's all over the place. Uh, and if you just glance online, you'll find tons of references to very famous female athletes from those times as well. Uh, there were many famous strong women, such as uh, Laverie Vallée, whom you see here, Elise Luftman. That was, uh, she was from the, the early to mid uh, 1800s. There was Kate Williams, also known uh, by her stage name Volcana, who was an early strong woman, uh, very famous, Katie Sandwina. And um, you'll also, and some of those were, were foreign, by the way. Um, uh, we'll get back to the USA in a second. Um, and there were many anonymous athletes uh, that you just see pictured all over the place, such as this uh, Occupation by Women series from 1887. And in addition to strong women, you also had uh, American female champions of specific activities such as club swinging, swinging the, the Indian clubs, uh, boxing even, and fencing. Uh, Ella Hattan, whom you see here, uh, mostly known by her name Jaguarina, uh, she defeated more than 40 men on horseback and on foot with a heavy broadsword, often while in armor and on horseback. Uh, these events of hers were attended by tens of thousands of people, and she appeared in the major newspapers of the time. And she taught physical fitness to women. Now, I know what some of you are probably going to say, who might be on the other side of this topic. Ben, listen, these were the exceptions to the rule. These were very special cases, women who bucked the trend and didn't represent the common woman. And you'd be right to say that. They, they were the exceptions. These were celebrities of the time. So, acknowledging that, what I'm going to do now is to really look at the history of exercise and examine how much women in general were or were not a part of that. The question is not, did sexism exist in the USA, which of course it did, or, or did it exist in exercise, or were there people exercising who were racist? Of course, all of that is, that is true. But rather, was sexism or misogyny a fundamental or distinguishing feature of exercise in America? 
And my contention is, which I think you'll see as well, that it was not. Uh, exercise methods and physical culture were actually on the progressive side of things. And I'm only going to address the gender, the gender side of this article uh, in this video today. The stuff on racism and white supremacy, I'm going to cover in a, in a totally separate video because it's such a huge topic. It needs its own video. So to address this idea that American women didn't really exercise prior to the 1960s, or if they did, it was very limited and weak. First off, as a preface to the USA, it's worth noting that just in the West, women in fitness goes back to ancient Greece and Rome. Uh, such as the Roman fresco that you see here from the, the Villa Romana del Casale. Uh, you see uh, girls exercising with dumbbells and other exercise tools. Uh, however, of course, that, that's not quite as relevant because in the terms of the lineage of modern exercise, we can trace modern exercise back to the 1700s in Europe and the USA. We don't really have comprehensive fitness systems at that time. Uh, but that century is when dumbbells and wands, which is like basically a short staff and is an important exercise tool, these start being used for physical exercise. You have various methods, they're not very systematic, which are, which are being introduced and popularized. And actually, the first image we have of the wand exercise is of a woman from the 1700s. Very first image. Uh, in terms of the dumbbell exercises, we have only a handful of texts from the 18th century, but of those texts that we do have, there is one from 1788 by William Rowley in which he recommends the dumbbell exercise specifically for women. And just a few years later in 1792, another book appears, and this one is written by a woman for women directing girls to exercise with the dumbbells. Uh, it was entitled Lessons of a Governess to Her Pupils by Madame uh, Sillery Brulart. So one, we only have a handful of texts on dumbbells from this time, but one of them is by a woman written for women. Six years later, after that, uh, Philadelphia, so we're now in the USA, still the 18th century. In 1798, another book is published by a man named Erasmus Darwin, entitled, quote, A Plan for the Conduct of Female Education. And in this book, he directs that young women work out with the dumbbells. So, right from the very origins of modern fitness, the 18th century, we see women are directly connected to the origins of these fitness methods, both as practitioners, as authors, and as teachers. They may not be in the majority, but they are very present in multiple significant ways. So, the dumbbells and wand exercise is brought to the USA in the 18th century where it stays. In fact, the earliest detailed text on the use of the dumbbells in the USA uh, which is more than just a cursory mention of it, is specifically for girls in 1825. And that is by John Griscom, which you see here. Now, back in Europe, during the 1800s, you have the rise of the wand exercise and Indian club exercises. And many of those early texts are women-focused. So we have, to, we have to acknowledge Europe here because the, the, these are the methods that are brought to the USA. So, so Europe is connected to this history. You have to mention it. We have, for instance, Gustavus Hamilton's Calisthenics for Ladies, published in 1827, wherein he has women exercising with the wand. Same thing in Germany. You see in Helderman here, 1835. And again, in Britain in the 1830s, you have the publication of Walker's Exercises for Ladies, which is one of the earliest British texts to show the use of Indian clubs, or the scepters, as they call them for women. Uh, and at this point, the wand and the Indian club exercise are brought to America. And in all of those cases, women are involved. In fact, the, the earliest evidence I have been able to find, and, and as far as I know that anyone has ever been able to find, for the Indian clubs being used and taught in America, well, the first one is by a guy named uh, J.K. Goodall, and he specifically says he's teaching both women and men. He's teaching women the use of the Indian scepters, as he calls them. And then only a few years later, in the late 1850s, you have the appearance of, this is the second teacher ever in the USA of Indian clubs that we know about, Madame Luby Foy of Paris. So we ha the second teacher ever that we know of in the USA of Indian clubs is a woman teaching women. So this is huge. This is, this is very significant. Um, in America, 
In the early 1860s, so just a few years later now, or in the, the era of the Civil War, you have the publication of two of the most popular exercise texts of the century, and that is Madison Watson's Calisthenics, uh, which actually uh, myself and my wife have done a lot of videos about that text on this channel. And there's also uh, Dio Lewis's New Gymnastics. These are co essentially co-ed texts which contain a large number of exercises for both sexes, including various types of apparatus, such as dumbbells, wands, Indian clubs. And these texts are also very important in that they tell us something about the number of women exercising at the time. Because although it's impossible to come up with exact statistics, the records just don't exist. We do know that these two texts I just mentioned, as well as the aforementioned Exercises for Ladies by Walker, these were printed a large number of times in the subsequent decades. And publishers only did that if the books were actually selling. They didn't just publish uh, books over and over again that weren't making money. So we know that these books were in demand and getting read quite a lot. In particular, Dial Lewis's book was continually printed from around 1860, the first edition, uh, well into the 1880s. So several, that's three decades right there. Another book worth mentioning is Simon Kehoe's Indian Club Exercises, which contained a section at the end specifically for women. And the author also says that all of the exercises which picture men in the book can also be done by women. They should just use somewhat lighter clubs. Now, this is one of the most popular exercise books of the century. It was personally endorsed by President Ulysses S. Grant, as well as the famous boxer John C. Heenan. And the book was printed in at least nine editions between 1866 and 1886. So it was a very, very popular book. And there are at least 10 other exercise books published for women during this period in the English-speaking world. Now, although most of these books were written by men, the, the books for women, you do see a lot of female physical culture gurus, uh, like the one we mentioned before, and teachers during the second half of the century, both in America and Europe. Although it would take me a ton of work to come uh, up with exact statistics for you, uh, I can give you names and numbers for this period with regard to the Indian Club, uh, because for years I've been compiling a master list of all known Indian Club treatises in existence that were ever published. And I can tell you that between the years 1850 and 1905, there were at least seven treatises written by women with female authors on the Indian Club exercise alone. Uh, so it stands to reason that during the same period, there are also going to be plenty more women authors for dumbbell books, wand books, and just general calisthenic books. And in the 1900s, all of those numbers are going to go way up. They just do, because I've, I've just, I've been collecting, I've looked at books from these times, and there are, there are even more texts written by women and for women the, the further you get into the early 1900s. Uh, in terms of female exercise gurus of this period, I'll give you some prominent names. We have uh, Genevieve Stebbins, uh, an exponent of the Del Sartian method, um, which, and we've mentioned her in our previous video on YouTube uh, about breathing exercises. There's Jessie Hubble Bancroft, uh, someone I'm a big fan of. She was the top authority in the USA on posture and posture exercises. But she published many, many other books. She wrote about all different types of exercises and all different types of exercise tools. And she was in charge of the physical education for all of New York City school children, both boys and girls, and that which was a huge deal at the time. Uh, we did a video on her dumbbell partner exercises, which you can check out on YouTube uh, with myself and my wife. There is also Therese Stemple. Now, she was in, in Britain, so I'm getting out of the USA here, but I want to mention her. She was a daughter of a well-known fencing master. She wrote about the use of Indian clubs and others. Uh, then we also have Cornelia Clapp, who wrote the Manual of Gymnastics, prepared for the use of the students uh, of Mount Holyoke Seminary and published in Boston. And you can see a picture of her, both young and old here. Um, so she w these, these female authors were not just random people from the countryside who, who decided to write a book for vanity purposes. These were well-known uh, phys female physical culture gurus and teachers who were hired by universities who were very important people. 
You also have Mara Louise Pratt Chadwick, uh, who writes a textbook on the use of various implements to teach little girls. Uh, in 1890, you have The Handbook of Light Gymnastics, published by Lucy B. Hunt in Boston. Uh, and there was also Anna Morris, and she was writing for both girls and boys, as many of them did. And this is an important point I want to mention. Uh, these women were not just teaching other women. They were teaching girls and boys, and they were teaching adult women and adult men. Uh, there were many other women teachers, uh, for instance, who didn't necessarily write a book, so we, they're not as famous, but here's an image from John Harvey Kellogg's Battle Creek Sanitarium, which is pretty much the place, the health center of the USA in the 1800s. And in this picture, we see a woman teaching and leading a co-ed exercise class. So she's teaching grown men and grown women. And you can find many such uh, photographs from history of men and women in class together. Um, you know, and in terms of, um, you know, the trends and the fashions of the time, exercise was considered so fashionable for women at this time that you actually see designs for female gymnastic suits or gymnastic costumes appearing in the major fashion journals of the time. And the Met Museum actually has a number of uh, physical uh, antique specimens of these suits in their possession from the late 1800s. That just wouldn't be the case if it was this rare limited thing that only a few people were doing. And, and there are countless articles I've collected from the newspapers and the journals of the time just showing what all the women are doing and that that exercising and working out is the in thing it's the popular thing to do for women so that's just a very quick overview of uh, women in fitness history in America uh, from the 18th century to the end of the 19th century I think it's ignorance um, in part, but it's also, it seems to me a bit of narcissism to think that our generation is just so superior. You know, everyone who came before us was just a primitive savage and sort of backwards and, and unenlightened, and that then our generation in the last couple decades, you know, comes along to fix everything. Uh, and despite the problems of the past, women did do these exercises. Yes, there was sexism, as there is today, but that didn't stop women from exercising in, in vast numbers and teaching exercise in vast numbers. And it's an insult to those female pioneers to ignore them and pretend that they don't exist and glorify ourselves as being the great pioneers who are the first enlightened ones to address the issue. That may gratify our egos today or our collective egos as a culture and a society, but it's ultimately delusional and has no basis in reality. So I hope you leave now with the knowledge that American women did exercise in the past in great numbers that they were encouraged to do so, even forced to do so uh, in school, uh, and that they were guided by a large number of brilliant female authors and teachers who paved the way. As I said, we're going to continue covering uh, additional facets of this topic in greater detail in future videos, which you will see published on this channel very soon. So what do you think? Are the origins of exercise inherently sexist, or is there important information that I've left out? I look forward to reading your comments and conversations below. If you'd like to read related material, I'm the editor of Self-Defense for Gentlemen and Ladies, a classic 19th century text by Colonel Monstery, who taught many notable female athletes and champions. I am also the author of Irish Swordsmanship, which contains a chapter on 18th century female gladiators, who fought bloody contests with sharp weapons for fame and prize money. If you found this video informative, please like, subscribe, and share, and visit our other accounts on Instagram and Patreon. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.